the New Testament. And this letter is different from most of the other epistles, the letters that Paul had written. If you understand the Pauline writings, if you put it that way, Paul had written to the church at Corinth, Ephesus, Colossae, and all the other churches more in a doctrinal standpoint. The church at Rome, of course, the great doctrinal book of Rome, was somewhat of an authoritative demeanor, thus saith the Lord. This book is somewhat different. He writes to his friend Philemon that most people believe accepted Christ in Paul's ministry at Ephesus. And he's writing this letter not as a demand, but as a statement, I know you'll do the right thing, which we talked about last week, doing the right thing. We find in this particular portion of scripture, as I've outlined this, I have a hard time going more than three or four verses. There's so much meat there that we will unpack just verses four through seven this morning. We find in verse number five, there's a key word there he lists regarding Paul's testimony, excuse me, regarding Philemon's testimony and the confidence that he had in him. In verse number five, he has the word hearing. I've heard of your love and faith. It's kind of out there. I've heard of it. And it's good. We find in verse number six, the communication. That means that you're willing to share. Your communication, your sharing of your faith. I've heard about that as well, and I want that to continue. And not only acknowledging Christ, but also helping those saints, which we'll talk about. And then verse number seven, the very last part of the verse, he says, because the bowels of the saint, or those of the saints, the, the heart of the saints, those that are hurting, you're refreshing them. You're helping them rest. So I want to preach a message I've simply titled this morning. Listen to me now. Think about you. Me. Do others have confidence in you. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. I ask that you guide and direct in this service. Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Lord, let this message fall on ground that has been plowed up and ready to receive it. And Lord, thank you for speaking to me first before I ever give it up. Lord, help us to have a testimony in our lives that others will have the ability to say, I know how they're going to respond. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and thank you. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Last week we talked about this letter. We taught the title of last week's message was Doing the Right Thing. We know that Paul and Onesimus had to do the right thing. Doing the right thing sometimes means a friend will have to confront you. Sometimes doing the right thing means confessing. Many times it means making it right with others. Asking for forgiveness. Doing the right thing means getting involved. It can be confronting a friend, faithful to the wounds of an enemy, of a friend rather, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, the book of Proverbs says. Paul was a prisoner. He was writing to the slave owner, Philemon, whose escaped slave was Onesimus. Onesimus had escaped. He had stolen some of Philemon's material. We're not sure what. He had fled to Rome and thought he could disappear in the confines of that large city in the Roman Empire. But lo and behold, he met the Apostle Paul. He came to know Christ as a Savior. He was a help to Paul. And Paul, after understanding who Onesimus was, understanding that his other friend, Philemon, had also been a new convert, he says, you need to go back to him. You need to make it right with what you've taken. And you also, to Philemon, he's saying, you need to make it 
You need to forgive Onesimus and free him, not because he's a servant, but he is a brother in the Lord. Paul had realized that he had a responsibility to write this letter on the behalf of Onesimus. Would this be an act of futility? Would this letter fall on hollow ground? Would this letter, how would Philemon respond? Well, I want to tell you this morning, I think there's evidence here in these three verses, or four verses rather, there's ample evidence that Paul had a good idea how this letter would be received. He had a good idea how it would be received because of the evidence of Philemon's new life in Christ. It became clear that Paul had to take care of this. If he was going to intervene in the master-slave relationship that was fully entrenched in the culture of the day, Paul undercuts the, undercut, the culture, though, by making it clear that he himself was a prisoner of the Lord. So I want to ask you something. Can you have confidence in how others will react to certain situations? Now it doesn't mean that your past, you don't live in your past. Praise God that when Christ becomes a part of your life that's forgiven and people do change. I'm not trying to negate that. But we know and you know and I know people that because of the way they've acted, because of their testimony, you have a good idea how they're going to react. Sometimes when you meet people, you, get, you have to take care of an issue. And all of us deal with this, whether it be at work, whether it be at home, in the family, sometimes have a bit in a church. You get sweaty palms, you start to, you know that, you're a little nervous because you know that it's not going to go well. It's because of their past. Our past can do a lot. Our past indicates a lot about how we will react. My children, when they were in high school and college, and I know this sounds, I'm not trying to lift up my wife and I, but we never in the entire time were shocked in any of the grades they got. Not one time. I mean, we might have been a little disappointed. Maybe it should have been, you know, A and it was a B and it was an A. It should have been an A, it was a B or something like that. But there was never this cataclysmic shock that some parents get. Oh, no, I can't believe they flunked every class. It never happened to us. Now, my children, especially in college, did have a couple of classes they flunked, but the reason that was not a shock to us is because we knew that was coming because of discussions, because of things that were happening in their life, and it wasn't a shock to us. And, we, and because of that, we knew that, by and large, their report card was going to say whatever it would say. Because we knew what was going on in their lives. We knew that what was happening, we knew about the study and the interim grades. We saw those type of things. When my kids were in college, I remember most specifically, we kept up with where they were going. We didn't fall over and say, oh, believe it, I can't believe they flunked out every course. And I'm not saying if you've done that, you're a bad parent. I'm not saying that at all. That's just where we were because we had confidence, not in how their grades were going to be, but we had confidence that we knew where it was going to end. And I want to tell you, Paul had the same type of confidence when he wrote this letter. He knew how this letter would be responded to based upon Philemon's testimony. So let's move on to the first point here. His faith in Christ was known. We find here, he says, your faith is known. Look at verse number five, please. Verse number five. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Hearing, understanding, I have heard of your love. I've heard of your love and faith. Your faith to the Lord and your love for others. That is not something that is hidden or in a closet. Hearing of his love. 
One writer said this, We have every reason to believe that Philemon was a choice trophy of grace of God, the kind of man you would like to have as a friend and a brother. And ladies and gentlemen, he was a newly saved, newly converted Christian, and Paul, understanding his new life in Christ, had a good idea when he received this letter how he would respond. There were two qualities there, his love and his faith. The object of faith is the Lord Jesus. The object of love was the saints. He would love the Lord, and that spilled over. Look here, how we treated other people. How we treated other people. Think about this. Since Philemon loved all the saints, surely this could include Onesimus, now a saint in his life. No doubt. His faith in Christ was not secret. It wasn't something that he did in the club. Illustration years ago. Several have heard this before, maybe more than once, I don't know. In 1995, when I was working at Urban Engineers in Philadelphia and was resigning to go into the ministry, I uh, was going around saying my goodbyes to everybody and this group and that group and, you know, whatever. And one of our clients, our biggest client that I had was the Philadelphia Regional Port Authority. And I'd worked with them and with some of the docks down there and part of the Coast Guard group there in Philadelphia. And one of our clients, it was a guy I worked with, we went, I mean, if you've been in the business world and you've had meetings and big projects, you kind of, they become a part of your family. You're just with them all the time. And uh, there was an engineer that worked for the Port Authority who was, I was friends with. Well, he came up to me, and he says, I can't believe you're leaving, blah, blah, blah. And he went through the whole thing. I said, well, I feel the Lord's calling me to go into ministry. Blah. And he goes, well, can I tell you something? And he says, and he gave me his testimony, and he says, I'm a Christian. I was so angry at him for telling me that because we had been through so many battles for years. I say battles, you know, we worked together, and he knew my faith. He knew about my family. He knew that. And yet, he, there was nothing indicating he knew the Lord. In fact, just the opposite was true with his testimony. And I said to him, why are you just now telling me this? And he didn't have an answer. See, his past was not an indication that he was a Christian. In fact, it was, as I said earlier, just the opposite. But we find here in this text, in this text, he said, I heard of your love which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus. I heard this stuff. Philemon had a good idea. I mean, excuse me, Paul had a good idea how Philemon would respond to a letter that's asking him to free Onesimus and to forgive him of what he'd taken. Had a good idea. Secondly, his faith in Christ was shared. So he talks about hearing of thy love. He says that that communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, which is in you in Christ Jesus. The communication of thy faith, or the sharing of thy faith. It's interesting. The sharing of your faith may become effective. One translation says to put the full knowledge of everything that is in us for the sake of Christ. Your faith will be shared. The sharing of your faith, the communication of your faith, means practical kindness along with sharing your witness of what the Lord has done. Works in the community as well. We can share our faith not only by preaching Christ, but also by helping those in need. People do not care how much you know until they know you care. If there's ever been a time in my lifetime with a secular humanist 
the caustic nature of our culture. If there's ever been a time that we need to show how much we care, it's today. Let me tell you why. Because I am convinced the future of Christianity rests on us earning a right to be heard. You have to earn that right. People will not give it to you anymore like they did in past times. And we need to get the gospel out. The gospel, the Bible says, the book of Isaiah says that, that it will not return void. I understand that. But I believe that Philemon, rather, had earned the right to be heard by his brothers and sisters in Colossae. There's tremendous in power and influence in a life where the love of God is manifest. Paul prayed that Philemon's life would, and benevolence would lead many to acknowledge that it's all good, it's good deeds came from Christ. That's exactly what verse number 6 says. Word for word. There's tremendous power and influence that we have. There's good evidence how you to respond. Let me ask you this. Look, look at our community. What does our community think about you and me in the church. Tom Rainer is the, the book that led to many things that convicted me about our church. He said, if your church disappeared, would anybody other than those who attend miss it? Think about that. Now, you think about that and compare it with the early churches. They were not an island unto themselves. They were the forefront of giving the gospel. Many had to lay down their life for their faith. Many would take people in, those that were hurting, those that were sick, those that had up that needed a touch of grace. And that's how many, many came to know Christ. It's not the social gospel. That doesn't save anybody. Evidence of how he'd respond. He was a church leader. He was known in the community for sharing his faith with works to back it up. Would your friends and neighbors know and see your faith? I thought of that. Shame on us. We started a benevolence offering last year. We've been able to help out people in the community and giving out gospel tracts and those that we don't ask for anything in return. And you can't fund, feed, clothes, and house everybody. I'm totally aware of that. But I believe, like Philemon, we should be known by the evidence of what we do. No doubt about that. His faith was shared in the community and was out front and center. Thirdly, I want to show you something. His faith was refreshed others. Now, this is really interesting. His faith refreshed others. Look at verse number 7. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels, that means the inner works, the heart of the saints is refreshed. The innerness of your life. You are helping us. That word refreshed comes from the same Greek word that we use rest in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter number Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28, the, uh, Jesus speaks, Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The same word. Refreshed and rest. In other words, what he is saying here in this text is you are helping others rest. Be refreshed. Is that you and my, is that our, Paul, is that our testimony? Paul was writing and says, I have confidence in you because I've seen you're helping others be refreshed. What a ministry he had. Paul had a great privilege to lead Philemon to the Lord and how rewarding it would be to hear that he's helping the hearts of the saints be refreshed and rested. And he says, beloved brother, by thee, brother. When's the last time we had anybody, we helped anybody and helped them 
to rest. Occasionally, we have a lot of families here with little kids. A lot of them. I'm not sure how they all show up, but they seem to be coming in the nursery about every three months. There's more of them coming in. One way we'll figure out what causes all that, but most of you know what I'm talking about. And one of the issues that my wife and I had four kids. We got 11 grandkids, and we have, you know, dealing with all that. We know one thing a mom needs if she has small children is what? Rest. And the greatest thing sometimes my wife and I can do, and we do it even in church because our kids live all over the United States and various places, the closest ones in Ohio, one in Philadelphia, one in Charlotte, one in San Francisco. We know that we can't necessarily help them out. But we can't help out people here. And sometimes a young mom just needs somebody to take her kids so she can rest. I don't care if you have one or you have seven. You need rest. And that's the same type of idea that Paul is saying here. I've heard you're helping others Think of that. One of the reasons my wife went down to Columbus, Ohio last night after Javante went to the hospital because she knew my daughter had five other kids and she needed some rest. Now I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if you and I have that kind of testimony and that's the way we are convicted, I want to tell you when the message of the gospel is given, there's a whole more likelihood that it will receive than trying to shove a track in somebody's face and telling them the truth. And I'm not necessarily saying that doesn't work, but I am saying in this culture and this day and age, people need to hear the truth in love. Philemon's love resulted in a joy and encouragement for those that were refreshed the hearts of the saints. His testimony was one when he was there. He made a difference. And sometimes we don't know how to react, right? Give me an example. We find from these four verses, it was pretty clear how he was going to react to this letter, I think. And I've done the best to unpack it. But let me give you an example. If you've ever bought a dog from the pound, a dog that maybe is not a puppy, but a dog that is maybe a year or two old, some of you have done that. We have. And one time when our kids were smaller, we bought a dog that had been in the pound. It got another owner giving it back and whatever. Dysfunctional dog, you want to call that such a thing. Anyway, the dog, we got the dog, and we named the dog Reuben. And I don't know why, but his name, her name was Reuben. And I remember when we first got the dog, I went to pet the dog, and he turned around and kind of winced. You know the why? Everybody look here. Because that dog, the only experience that dog had ever had with a male was getting a tar beat out of him. And that dog, by past experience, reacted differently. Can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Paul, in his writing here, said, I know, Philemon, how you're going to react. Because I'm looking at what's done, and I believe it's going to be good. But sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, with Christians, people wince because of the way they've been treated in the past. One of the areas that prevented me from accepting Christ, and I know it's the sovereignty of God, God's grace and his mercy, and God foreknew, I know all of the doctrines. But one of the reasons I repelled at Christianity was the way I saw some people who claimed to know Christ live. And it wasn't good. And when God spoke to me years later, I accepted Christ as my Savior. But I think, in retrospect, why did it take me several decades before I accepted Christ? 
I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, what Paul is sliding here. He said that he refreshed him. No one lives a life unto themselves and himself. No one dies unto himself. Our actions do affect others. We cannot measure the range of our influence. We have limitless potential for good and for evil. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'll close with this statement. What does your present testimony say about how you will act in future situations? Think about that. Maybe you need to confess some things. Maybe you need to leave this service and go apologize. Maybe you need to get on your hands and knees and say, God, thank you for saving me. I'm convicted. Does your faith refresh others? Let's all stand with every head bowed and every eye closed. Dearly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for all of us, pastor and people alike, that because of our testimony, people can have a good idea how we're going to react. Because of the past testimony, people will see, have an understanding of how we do. Then, Father, I ask that you guide and direct this invitation. For some, maybe it's a time for salvation. Praise God. God's speaking to you. We'd like to show you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. For others, maybe it's a time of confession between you and God. Maybe you need to pray for a loved one that's hurting. The invitation is open to all. Guide and direct and lead as only you can, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. As Iris begins to play, why don't you come down and pray. Ask the Lord to guide and direct. People are coming. You can make your way down. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for your goodness. I do pray that you would help us as we look at the life of Philemon. And Lord, help us have a testimony that speaks volumes to others on how we will react. Thank you for the convicting message to me on this as well. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. Just a couple of things real quick will be dismissed. From now on, for all future signups, we're doing it on the app or our website. If that's something you're not familiar with, we have a little tablet out there. You can type in everything, put your information in. If you don't want to pay online on the tablet, you can hit a button and you can pay cash right there at the, uh, at the uh, Welcome Center. We're trying to get a better handle on all the events that we sign up for around here, and that'll make us, it, it helps us get a better handle on who's coming, who's not coming, what money's been collected, and that type of thing. So if you don't have an, our church app, you should. 
uh, and if you don't, if you have a cell phone, but if you something you don't have, you can still sign up out there at the. We have a little tablet that'll help you out as well. All right. Well, God bless you. Look forward to our C groups tonight. We'll have uh, that'll start at five o'clock. Wonderful meal at six o'clock. Look forward to seeing you all. God bless you. You're dismissed.